Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of approving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material, if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. I'm Major Randy Briggs. Dr. Mike Perlman and I, for the next 40 minutes or so, will uh, try and discuss what approaches to teaching Lesson 10, World War II in Europe, for the MS-610 course. Uh, I'll start out by uh, listing the learning objectives, we'll discuss some themes and then uh, and proceed through uh, our varying ideas of how you might want to approach this lesson. Over the course of this 40 minutes, we'll try and provide some background information uh, that places the readings that your students have in context. The readings support a, uh, a, a look at the European war basically from Normandy forward to the end of the war. Now, Normandy didn't just occur in isolation. We're going to try and give you some uh, some background information that puts that in context. We'll try and give some teaching tips as we go along as well. Um, one thing I think you can do is uh, is point at, or, or be aware of that is is that World War II for your students for most Americans is ancient history. Uh, we just went through the 50th anniversary here in, over uh, the past several years, and so it's been brought back up. But uh, for for most of your students who have been born in the 1960s, World War II is 15, 20 or so years uh, before they were ever born. So just uh, keep that in mind, that the challenge to bring it up and make it relevant to today, and I think uh, we'll be able to demonstrate how it is relevant to today. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to review the learning objectives, and they are to evaluate the planning and conduct of selected operations in the European theater of World War II. Uh, the second is to analyze the joint and combined operation that brought the Allies ashore in Normandy on 6 June 1944. So again, we have the Normandy focus. Throughout the discussion, uh, some some consistent themes uh, emerge. One is the difference between the British and the American strategical concepts. Uh, and we'll get into more of that uh, a little later. Uh, the constant, uh, or, or the Mediterranean theater, it's always there. Uh, is it the soft underbelly of the Axis, as Churchill uh, states, or is it a sideshow? Or, as the Americans, some will come to call it a tar baby. Uh, the roles of air and sea power uh, are critical. This is not just an army, uh, army theater of war, but uh, a joint as well as combined theater. The arguments about narrow thrust versus broad uh, front, uh, as Montgomery terms it, 
keeping in mind political versus military objectives. And finally, I think, and uh, Dr. Perlman has suggested uh, this, is uh, the, to, to try and look at the Allied victory and, and discuss whether it is due to military excellence on the part of the Allies or to just strictly to their material superiority. So with that said, uh, we'll try and uh, discuss some of the background that leads up to, uh, to Normandy. And, and I think we can uh, start with the early war campaigns. Or do you want to try with British and American strategic concepts? Well, we can do that. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Let's do that. Um, which I guess boils down to um, your... Um, I guess the term I'm trying to now think of it is, is your basic idea, what's it called, the strategic concept of how the British or the Americans plan to beat the Germans, who certainly in 1942, without a doubt, man for man, gun for gun, the best army in the world, and lots of people thinking it may be the best army in human history, uh, with few comparisons. And then the question is, how can you come to grips and beat them? Do you really want to fight army versus army? I have to remember what the British uh, perspective is any time the U.S. Army, which believes the only way you can beat an army is to get down on the ground and beat them, is uh, the last time they faced the Germans in Europe in 1940. Um, the mainland of Europe, they didn't have to get there by an amphibious invasion. The most difficult of all military operation. They were there, they were on the ground, and they got their butt kicked off. And now what? These Americans want to tell them, come on with me, we're going back? I mean, what do you think of that as credibility? Thanks for your suggestion. Guess what? I we don't want to play. <laughs> I faced these guys for real in 1940 with the French in great depth. And you barely have, what, two to three divisions ready to fight in 42? Right. And you and, want to go back? And, and remembering back to the 40 campaign, the British and French actually outnumber the Germans. They have uh, numerical uh, parity as far as aircraft goes. They have uh, more tanks than the Germans do. On paper, they appear to have a superior force. Which is why that whole operation was such a shock. You crunch the numbers. And um, the American computers of 1940 say the Allies win, right. and they were crushed. It was what four weeks of serious fighting, two more weeks for uh, to get to Paris, and you want me to go back? Uh, well, if that's so, then how do the Brits plan to win this war? If it's not going to meet the German Wehrmacht in land combat at the ground. They want to fight them on the perimeter or the periphery uh, to attrit the Germans by uh, indirect means, by air power, by uh, peripheral operations, by letting, after, after June of 1941, letting the Russians attrit the Germans and, uh, and, and so that the, the British don't want to face the German army face to face until that German army has been ground down and, and worn away. In other words, when we, we the British, come to grips as we eventually must with the German army in Northwest Europe, it is going to be a German army which is a shadow of itself. We hope. Well, that's our, that's our strategy, is that somebody or other factors will essentially beat them. And our army is essentially a mop-up operation. Now, you need mop-up operations. Without them, you know, there's not a mop-up. Right. But essentially, the decisive factors will be done by other branches or other nations. It will be by, in some cases, the Russians it will be done by strategic bombing. 
Um, Which from 1940 uh, on is the only way the British have of actually striking at the Germans. The well, unless you want to put that ground force unless, across the right, shore. Unwilling to put a ground force across the English Channel again. The, the strategic bombing is their only weapon. And, and their attempts to do anything with ground and forces. And also, of course, they would argue it's not only our only weapon. Ally, it's your only weapon. Right. Because anytime you start talking about us going ashore, particularly in 1942, the majority of that component is going to be, be British, British until 44. Absolutely. Because uh, like usual, World War II is no different than wars like usual in the United States, which is you declare them, and then you prepare to fight them. Right. So there's a year and a half to two years. And you've got uh, two great big oceans protecting you in the meantime. Well, at least protecting you, but we, like usual, will declare a war right. and then develop a force structure to fight it. Let me digress from this. We digress from the beginning. Sure we have. Uh, <laughs> Let's look at the German strategic situation as the Allies are having this debate. Well, so far we've heard one half of the debate, but the German situation uh, is interesting. There's an article by um, Michael Geyer in this book, uh, Makers of Modern Strategy, uh, which is has an excellent discussion of German uh, strategy from 1914 to 1945. And he describes every victory that Hitler gains in the first year and a half or so of the war, first year of the war, as actually worsening the German strategic position. In what sense? He, he invades Poland. So what, what does that get him? It gets Britain and France declaring war on him, which he didn't think they would do. He conquers, that's in the, in the fall, summer and fall of uh, 1939. He uh, conquers the Low Countries in France in the spring of 1940. And what does that get him? It, it gets him Atlantic ports. It gets him the resources of France. Seems to be great. Only Britain is holding out against him. But now the United States is morally and mentally uh, energized to try and save Britain. And so it gets the United well, the States. the United States really renounces its neutrality. In everything but in everything well, but, but official. It does everything but officially renounce its neutrality. Well, actually, it, it doesn't announce belligerency. Right. But what it does is it gives guns to one side, doesn't sell them, gives them to the British, freezes German assets so Germany cannot buy, let alone get this as aid. The United States is no longer, is not a neutral, but the United States wants to get security on the cheap. Right. In other words, do it by foreign aid, not by blood. And Franklin Roosevelt, who has sold this Lend-Lease to the U.S. public as a way of, in effect, war on the cheap, is now really, before Pearl Harbor, caught in his own dilemma. Because the American people say, okay, you prob you've given us security without without a high cost of blood, this was your promise, don't take it away from us. And uh, Well, in Roosevelt's big uh, quote, I think it's in the 1940 uh, presidential campaign that, that he, you know, he, he's, he's sick of war. He, he's sick well, he of war. Uh, I, uh, I, hate war. I hate war. <laughs> and I'll never send American boys to war. Uh, and, uh, and so there he is. But that's, that's his rhetoric in the 1940 campaign. But uh, um, actually, we can get into this. It, it affects, to his military strategy even after Pearl Harbor because he, he, he's got political responsibility. He recognizes how, um, um, how reluctant the United States was to move from a war of limited liability, which is essentially Lend-Lease, to another American expeditionary army so that until late 1943, planning for D-Day, you've got the U.S. Army on one side, which is the only way to beat the German Army is to get down on the ground and beat them. 
force on force, power on power. You've got the British saying, oh no, we would have this again. Franklin Roosevelt, as an individual, leans more to the British side than he does to the U.S. Army side. Well, Which is former Undersecretary of the Navy. Navy. He's a Navy guy. And, but he's also a politician. Yeah. And, and this expansion of a giant new AEF is by no means popular. Right. If we can win this war by strategic bombing, if we can win it by lend-lease, let's at least do this. Why mortgage the farm right now when we might be able to get off with short installment plans? Well, which, which makes Marshall's achievement in building up a powerful United States Army uh, all the more remarkable because he's doing it without unified political support. Well, he's certainly not doing He certainly has, has a president who will never confront Marshall directly. Roosevelt will always speak around issues, not giving him the support. But frankly, when it comes right down to it, the U.S. Army kind of ends up in kind of a middle position. It's nowhere, it's 90, 89 divisions actually. They right. planned on 90 divisions. Right. But when I think the U.S. The Cavalry Division was was never formally activated, I well, think, maybe that's that sort of, maybe I think that's that a, the division that fell out. It was, but um, when the U.S. Army, in the bowls of the Pentagon, making their own plans, they're talking somewhere between 200 to 300 right. divisions. Right. Now that just will not fly. It's made up the difference. Which would still be fewer combat divisions than even the German Army has. Uh, yeah. Um, of course, those with a much smaller population, smaller division, yeah, true, no but not question. that much smaller. Uh, the differentiation is made up by um, by Russian divisions and U.S. air power, right. uh, which compensates for uh, some of the, the lack of numbers we have on the ground. Um, Mike, let me get back to the kind of the chrono kind of chronological narrative here. All right. Uh, okay, we we've we've laid out the British. Uh, strategic perspective. We're kind of a little bit into the American perspective. You can see that there's sort of divided counsel in the American camp, which uh, leaves the Americans <laughs> at least in the early stages of negotiating with the British for a combined strategy, somewhat susceptible to British domination because the Americans are not of one mind. Uh, let's go back and look what's been going on in the war itself. Uh, we, we left off with the conquest of France, uh, ju uh, June of 1940. Within a month, month and a half, Germany starts the air campaign that will be known to history as the Battle of Britain, supposedly as a prelude to invasion of the British Isles. Um, they lose that air campaign for several reasons. Poor tactics, uh, short range of their fighters. Uh, but the bigger question is, uh, were they ever really seriously going to invade? Did Hitler ever seriously plan an invasion, or was he always hoping for a reasonable accommodation, a peace with Great Britain that would allow him to control the rest of Europe without interference? Well, the it, it, apparently the, the, the deal that he would have liked to have made at the time is, I guess like many Europeans, they don't know whether England is a part of Europe or not. Lots of Englishmen don't know whether they're parts of Europe or not. Is that if I could come with, quote, a reasonable peace, which means England, you, you know, remember, England declares war on Germany. Germany doesn't declare war on England. Right. It's not like Russia, Poland, or France, one of Germany's long historical enemies back 400 years. Right. In fact, the English and the Germans were allies in the 18th and early 19th century against the historical enemy of England, which has been France. Right. And, and even into uh, the World War I era, the German and British crowns are, the, 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 the Kaiser well, and the King are a cousin, and of course everyone's a cousin. Well, if, time, but if, if England, in, in Germany's perspective, would come to its senses and make this deal, I don't plan to have a German Gauleiter or a Holocaust of the English citizenry. Uh, let's be sensible. The thing is that 
written for which all of us should be immensely thankful today is that they didn't quote make those, this deal because you know a those deal stiff necked unreasonable it, well the thing is what do you do you make a deal with this um, with this uh, I'm, devil. I'm looking for an the devil and you always know it is a deal of convenience meaning that what do we do in five or six years when he gets some later ambition um, but uh, the English um, will not make this deal they will not revoke their declaration of war and I guess he has lots of hopes maybe some strategic bombing will uh, will drive the British to their senses meaning that they are a democracy they can get rid of that uh, that uh, Churchill right. and um, we could get an appeaser in and we can cut a deal but they don't uh, the, the strategic bombing campaign conducted with medium rather than heavy bombers uh, they're not the army, built to right, win the war they're, built, they're built to support the army yeah close country. air support air force has got a strategic bombing mission Can't and they're it. gonna, gonna do it too well so they, they don't knock the British out by bombing they try and do it with the Battle of the Atlantic Churchill will later say the Battle of the Atlantic which runs from 1940 to 43 the critical about mid 43 about yeah. 43 that that's the, the that that's the closest or that's the the, the most danger Britain faced was from the Battle of the Atlantic. So that's the only thing you really feared. Really feared, right? Um, if they, if, if the German U-boats control the Atlantic, right. the U.S. could have eight million divisions. Sh showing it again, doesn't matter anything. They're not going past Brooklyn. Supporting Geyer's point that Hitler is strategically bankrupt. Of course, he starts this naval war with what sixty some submarines, with a totally inadequate submarine force to sever Britain's. Uh, uh, sea lifeline for uh, for trade. Uh, now we need to uh, move along and look at the American uh, side of the strategic debate. Let's look at the U.S. Army perspective, and that is uh, George Marshall has built this army from uh, 170,000 in 1940 to by 1944 uh, some seven million, of which about five, uh, four and a half million are actually in army ground yeah. and are not in the Army Air Force. Uh, the Army's concept is the way to defeat Nazi Germany is cross the channel at the earliest possible moment, clo come to grips with the German Army and defeat it in battle. The it's a battle of strength on strength, strength on strength. Anni That's right. annihilation. That's right. Our Military strength against strength strength theirs. Against their strength. And uh, that they, they look with, at the British uh, peripheral or perimeter operations, the British attempts at indirect approach with the American Army does with they look at that with great suspicion. Yeah, can I, um, Randy? Let me def define, if I can, for uh, this indirect or peripheral approach. The English perceive that even in ground forces, if we we control at least the surface of the oceans of the world. Um, is that if we can land a force at some place which is difficult for the German army to reinforce, North Africa, Greece, or whatever, it would be our first ground team versus their third or fourth. This is the thing about getting victories on the board. Um, which after the debacle of 1940, it makes sense. I don't want to have our strength on their strength. I want to have our strength even on ground forces on their weakness. Right. Now the U.S. position in something like that is even if you get a victory against their weakness in a place like North Africa or Greece, what have you gotten? Right. I mean it's it's chump change. It really doesn't matter. That's where there's a reason why they're strong in Northwest Europe. That's what's important. That's where they're going to be beaten. Well and of course uh, that that is uh, that's the American position and in the debates that strategic debates that occur throughout 1942 the American or the American Army position does not prevail and the Allies go into North Africa the invasion of uh, our operation torch uh, gets the couple of reasons for Operation Torch that you can discuss with the students. Uh, why Operation Torch? Why North Africa? 
British won't agree to any other major operation in 1942. And they're going to be the senior partner. They're the senior partners. In, simply in terms of investment, is that there are more of us right. being committed than you. The other thing is, frankly, behind the back of the U.S. Army, is that Roosevelt leans more at this period to the British point of view than he does to the U.S. Army point of view. And there's a strategic need uh, or a political need to, to maintain a strategic uh, policy, and that is the policy of Europe first that has been agreed upon uh, going back to the fall of 1941, meaning or the that, summer. Meaning that if Roosevelt doesn't come to grips with the Germans somewhere, in 1942. in 1942, then what is going to happen? Meaning that the Guadalcanal operation, uh, New Guinea with MacArthur, uh, w those guys who are begging for more and more troops. And will say, we need reinforcements because at least we're coming to grips right. with the enemy. Right. Will create what I guess Eisenhower calls, he calls them suction right. cups, right. is that that need for reinforcement will preclude the buildup in, in the European theater to ever get across the channel. And, and the, fight which the means Germans. then, I guess, if you don't win by strategic bombing, uh, you don't win at all. Win. So we get sucked into the Mediterranean. Sucked is a bad word. We go into the Mediterranean. You're an what army officer, though, listen, they were a <laughs> lot more angry than being sucked <laughs> in at that time. This this waste of, of time and resources. So the U.S. Army th thinks. The U.S. Army says we got our, our shirts. Uh, we lost our shirts. We got our clocks cleaned by, by, with, by politically, the British, politically. Being br brought, brought into, into what is this? This is like meaningless. Meaningless di diversion right. Right. of men and resources away from the war that has to be fought sooner or later. Right. Now, I was going to discuss mid-war campaigns, Battle of the Atlantic as it goes into 43 when we finally turn the tide, uh, our operations in North Africa, Sicily and Italy uh, were, were sort of uh, close on time. So let me just very quickly touch on those. Uh, finally, uh, the table or the tide starts turning uh, in the spring of 1943 on the Battle of the Atlantic for a number of reasons. Escort procedures, more destroyed. Uh, air coverage of the uh, of the air gap out in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, U.S. productivity starts, starts rolling right. into 43. But some of it's doctrinal and training okay. as well. Uh, North Africa. Uh, we do great at Operation Torch. Of course, we're only fighting the Vichy French in November of 1942. In February of 43, when the Germans counterattack with, with not even the first team, but the, they're Germans, uh, we get our clocks no, cleaned at Cassidy. Two German divisions. Right. Well, under a, obviously, a tactical genius, Rommel. Right. But in effect, he is coaching a, a kind of a little league team. Yeah, that's a good now, point. He's world's greatest <laughs> manager of, in effect, an undergunned. Right. With an army which is what, 60 or 65 percent Italian. And uh, even so, he exposes a lot of doctrinal weaknesses in the Allied uh, forces in North Africa, uh, training and doctrinal weaknesses in the American army, uh, poor use of the combined arms team. Uh, the, U the U.S. Army is lucky to hold uh, with tremendous losses in the Battle of Kasserine Pass. It, yeah, uh, it here's the irony. In fact, if the U.S. Army is really unprepared as it was to go to war, the Germans in 1942 had crossed the channel. As That's the, the US, eternal point. As the U.S. Army wished to. What would have happened had this army tried to cross the channel in, in effect, the fall of 1942? It might have been a disaster. It might have been a disaster. In fact, in fact let me just say, if I may, it was expected, frankly, by Eisenhower and Marshall that it would be a disaster. Now, why would these gentlemen in 42, in effect, set the U.S. Army up for what for I failure. for what Marshall? Well, Eisenhower called it at the time a sacrificial mission. Marshall later called it suicidal. In 42, nobody really knows the strength of the Russian army. 
but lots of people who think it's going down the tubes and it will may not last into 43 unless it's relieved. Well, that's the, this, the whole premise of the, of the proposed fall 42 invasion sledgehammer, well, is, is that, if the Russians are on the verge of collapse, then we must attempt a desperate invasion to try and stay there. Um, or if the Germans yes. are on the verge of collapse, well, then we've got to get an invasion so we can but mop that's up the, the mop up right. operation. It is not the the ghastly fight. Now, but Eisenhower says um, I may sacrifice six Allied divisions to preserve an eight million man Russian army. Right. This is grim business. Nobody said it was it was it was fun. Right. I, and uh, it's not a picnic. But with this thing, it's probably this association. If it may seem shocking to us today, I know when I first began to learn something about it, I was surprised. Being a, a child, yes, I was once, of the Cold War, is that there's a very strong alliance between the U.S. Army and the Red Army. Because the U.S. Army by 42 comes to the conclusion the only way they're ever going to get ashore is if something like 60 to 75 percent of the German army is isn't in, in France Europe. and it's in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Europe. Right. So in effect, now, and if we can't get ashore, then the only way we can beat them is by periphery pecking and strategic long, bombing. Long and the U.S. Army, you tell them that, they think you're some bunko artist. Right. The only way the you army beat the German army is to that. beat the German army. Okay. Now, we, in uh, May of 1943, the Axis surrender in uh, uh, our counteroffensive after the Germans, uh, or after the Axis offensive at Castle. Uh, traps them in Tunisia. Eventually they surrender in Tunis in May of 1943. 225,000 Axis about evenly split between Germans and Italians. What to do next? The strategic bait debate uh, begins again. Uh, all sort the, the American chiefs, especially the army, don't want to go any further in the Mediterranean. They now want a 43 invasion of but Europe. But it's too late. But it's too late in the year. It's, it's too, too late to get You cannot troops. redeploy and the landing craft and, and Churchill, shortage. And, Churchill's and, no fool. Guess what? You have gotten now you've two got rungs all, up the ladder. Right. Now, What are you supposed to do? Get off the ladder? Right. When was the last time you got off the ladder to right. move it? Right. You know, repairing, so, repairing a shingle in your house, let alone redeploying an army. So the uh, forces are in the Mediterranean. They, the, the, the only way to productively employ them in 1943 is keep them in the Mediterranean. Which means? And, which means Greece, Sardinia, Sardinia? No, it means Sicily. Um, Sicily is chosen supposedly because it won't lead to an invasion of the Italian mainland. That's Had, what the U.S. That's Army what the U.S. Hopes. Army hopes. Sardinia would be better to invade Italy, uh, from which to invade Italy because it's further north up the boot. But of course, si the British know something here. Sicily is rung three or rung four on right. that ladder. So, uh, what uh, some will call the Churchill's tar baby, uh, the Mediterranean has got us stuck and so we go from Sicily which reveals some more flaws in joint cert, joint and yeah. combined doctrine and, and uh, practices and but is successful and uh, lo and behold Italy seems ready to fall out of the war and join the allies and so some if might you, say if you go Sicily is too successful if you will invade us our, we will we after will all, we did, yeah we, after all you don't expect us to switch sides when there are nothing right. but Germans here right. for heaven's sake so uh, some would say Sicil that Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily, was too successful. We follow it in September of 43 with the invasion of Italy. And now, 20 months of grinding uh, frontal attacks against an enemy that always has the high ground, that always has the strong terrible defensive terrain position. position. Terrible terrain. That's the Few soft avenues underbelly. The soft underbelly turns out to be uh, hard as a, as a rock. And we spend 20 months there. Uh, what a wonderful economy of force campaign it is for the Germans is about the s summary of the, of the Italian Something campaign. else, however, is really happening in 1943, which will uh, lead to the, I hate to say irrevocable, because with Franklin Roosevelt, nothing is irrevocable, but 
the irrevocable commitment to the cross-channel invasion uh, in Normandy, which is made at the Tehran conference, the first time that Roosevelt meets with Stalin, Churchill being there in 1943. Stalin is the great proponent of of the opposite position of Churchill, which is to get the Germans in a giant pincer. Me to the east, you to the west, and just grind them and crush them down. Now, 43 is a kind of a transition year for Roosevelt. He it's begins, where he stops he, being a wholehearted supporter of Churchill. And Churchill, which is the Casablanca conference right. in January, where By he no, is, uh, is on the Churchill team. And by November at he Tehran, is, he's, he is he's on now, the, he is on a, now one of the things which is, does this, uh, is the Stalin. 1943 is the first year of strategic bombing of Germany. In 42, U.S., to the end we had bombing, most of it were kind of hopeless attacks on subpens, um, close air support, using bombers in North Africa. And in 43, 43, the 8th Air Force really starts its strategic yeah, bombing campaign. Without long-range fighter without, escort. And it suffers badly to the point where by bad. fall of 1943, the Germans appear to have won the air war. Well, let's put it this thing. They're doing more damage to our planes than the, we're doing to their factories. Right. And it means that, whoops, you know, I had all those great ideas about mop-up operations for armies for wars that are won from the sky. Guy, but like most ideas, it there's, there's a difference practice. between the concept and the, the execution. Concept was wonderful. Okay, the well, facts that were that weren't very nice. Back to your point about Tehran. That's where Roosevelt promises Stalin that we will in, the al Western Allies will invade in the spring of '44, and, and, and announces and Stalin says, promises, "Who's, who's going to be the commander if you're going to invade?" Well, you mm. in other words, you don't trust me. Uh, you so think this that's is what forces promise? the appointment of uh, of Eisenhower. Name a name, appoint a guy in charge. Let's and get so a command headquarters. By and January of 1944, seriously. Eisenhower is setting his headquarters up in England uh, to uh, just, Supreme Commander Allied. Just one thing on the Russian aspect on this, what Stalin then promises Roosevelt is that if you go ashore in France, I guarantee it. Now, this is not a guy whose word you actually trust, since there are millions of graves in the Soviet Union of people, of people yeah. and families who trusted him. Uh, that you know, not very funny, I guess, in retrospect, yeah. is he will say, uh, I guarantee there will be no reinforcements, uh, let alone from Eastern Europe, from Central Europe, from Germany. Meaning that if you go ashore, I will, I will keep them tied down. I'll in keep the, them uh, on. In the east. Now, what happens is the U.S. obviously wants joint planning and specifics. And to which liaisons, Stalin is amazingly unhelpful. Oh yeah, yes. Stalin uh, doesn't allow nobody right. in his headquarters. But they do. Uh, they do uh, launch their offensive there in the summer of '44. And as uh, Bob Bauman, uh, also of Combat Studies Institute, has said, that uh, well, the Normandy invasion serves as a wonderful little diversion that, to that is set standard, up Operation that is standard Migration. Standard Soviet history is three like weeks. Yes, yeah, three weeks after where. And this, we spend so much time worrying about getting ashore right. that the U.S. and the Allies in general don't worry as much about, about what you do the campaign when you get ashore. ashore. And we're caught down in the U.S. in particular, and I guess the worst terrain in God's earth for this. Yeah. Okay, let's look at why we why it is we have to uh, invade in the uh, spring of '44, and why do we choose Normandy? I mean, why invade? Germany's going to lose the war anyhow. I'm not nearly as sure as you are. Okay. The British say that he's... that. The, oh, sooner or later. We can look back on it from, with 2020 hindsight and say the Germans are going to lose. I'm not sure I agree. Okay. For wonderful arguments, why to invade? Stephen Ambrose's book, D-Day, June 6, 1944, is great. Uh, 
basically the Allies have to come ashore. They, the American strategic concept is finally, uh, finally prevails anyway, if not if it's not vindicated, and that the Allies will come ashore. They will come to grips with the Germans in 1944. Why Normandy? A lot of other places. Could Tell go into me, Brittany. Do we have a good could map? Go into the Low Countries. Well, if we had a map back there, uh, some considerations that drive Normandy. It's got to be within fighter range. Uh, it's got to be reasonably close to the debarkation uh, points. Embarkation points uh, uh, for the uh, for the landing for the uh, landing ships. Yeah, but if uh, we do a cross channel, we land in Calais. We avoid two river crossings. The same. Absolutely, the they all absolutely. they all tend to drive towards the pot, the Calais area. And we would go straight in a great distance. We would get a soon liberation it's got a good of road Antwerp. Network. Good road Has network. much better road yeah. network. We'd be we'd be within we'd be in the Ruhr Valley, the industrial heart. It only has Germany. one. This, the, the Calais only has one disadvantage. Which is? <laughs> uh, it's that uh, the Germans expect. It's that, so that good. That's land. what they expect. That's Anybody right. who has any brains And the strongest land portion of the Atlantic Wall is, of course, built at Calais. Normandy meets a lot of other requirements reasonably well, uh, and so Normandy is the choice. And the other thing is the first issue of any amphibious invasion is getting you ashore. you got to get ashore. Is Before it, you can do anything else, The follow-up operation is is nice, but if there is right. no initial secure right. lodgement, right. your follow-up operation isn't uh, very important. It, this, th it, we need to keep in mind that Normandy, the Normandy invasion, is the key operation of the U.S. Army for this war. Uh, this is what George Marshall has built the U.S. Army to do, to invade a hostile coast in northern Europe and come to grips with the German army and decide the battle in the European theater of the war. Um, okay, the, some other points are the timing of the invasion, uh, weather considerations, uh, tides, uh, moonlight, uh, time of the moon rising, uh, all for the uh, various aspects, the bomber coverage, the airborne uh, drops, the landing at, uh, at dawn at, uh, at low tide to avoid the beach obstacles. Of course, that means the troops wounded on the beach then drown as the tide comes in. Uh, we need to, uh, and, and the reading by Dr. Gable supports this, the, uh, the organization of SHAFE, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, as a combined and a joint headquarters, uh, the most successful coalition force in modern military history. I think we can safely say that. Uh, because you look at that, it is not some sort of liaison officers between my army and your army. It is a headquarters in which for every British chief there's an American deputy. deputy. For every American chief there is a British deputy. It is really as close as it you is, can uh, get. It is interwoven yes. like that. So uh, it, it, uh, it has some advantages. One, it gets to form in a, uh, in a country that is not uh, under invasion. It's, the, the force is not in contact with the enemy. It has time to prepare. It gets to choose its time and place of, uh, of coming to grips with the enemy. Uh, and they still, there are still some problems uh, within Shafe. But all in all, it is uh, very successful uh, by the standards of joint and combined operations. And in addition, it's conducting the most difficult military operation, an amphibious assault on a hostile shore. Interesting about this, when Stalin was always complaining about to the to the Allies in 42 and 43, when, and he has complained at Tehran. This is the first meeting that, that Marshall has with him. And he says, you don't understand to Stalin, this is not a river crossing. A, ri a failed river crossing is a setback. A failed amphibious invasion it, across an calamity. ocean is a calamity. Uh, and, uh, and, oh, now, that, that brings to point something that Colonel <laughs> 
resident <laughs> course author uh, continually makes, and that is that the Germans and the Allies have a fundamentally different view of the English Channel. The Germans view it as an obstacle, a barrier, something awful to try and get across. The Allies look upon it, yes, it is that, but it's also a conduit. It's a highway. Uh, it's it's a means of getting where you want to go. That's the, the sea power orientation of the Allies. Yeah, well, it's not versus, necessarily the same thing as this, the U.S. Army. This may be some of the, the difference why we, of course, in retrospect, that's what cheap historians like me do. They do in retrospect, where we should have thought far more about the follow-up operation right. than the landing, right. is that the U.S. Army, as Army guys do, think of water as obstacles. Right. If we would have thought about it as an avenue of approach, and because of our overwhelming sea and air power, we can land anywhere right. we choose. Well, as, a, as, a, that, as an overall organization, Shafe is able to think of it in those in the terms of an avenue of approach, but okay. the land, the ground component, the Army guys planning the, the campaign on the ground, they are unable to look past yeah, what's, what's going to happen. What actually it the, turns the out to be, I can't remember the nature and the predict, predictions. I think the We get to about the D plus 5 line by D plus 50. Uh, but not only this in terms of casualties. Gee, I used to, didn't bring oh, oh, my the numbers. the casualties are less. Uh, the, in ca the, uh, the expectations in the initial were they were invasion. about the Desert Storm. Right. Those expectations of one third right. of, of the initial assault divisions are going to be casualties. Yes. It turns out to be, what, about 5 or 6 percent. I think it's and, about And really, 4, only, only the Americans and at this Omaha. Is a, and this is an accident right. because what happens is the Americans at Omaha run into an armored division. German armored division going from, I think it's Holland all the way to Brittany, just, just happens, happens to, be there. to be at Omaha Beach, the worst of all possible luck. It's also outside the most of that, difficult terrain. Yes, Omaha outside too, so. of that, this would have been even, right. I hate to say easier, but only in the expectation. So what happens is the initial assault is far easier than anybody expects, and the next and the, two months are absolute hell, right. far greater than anybody expects. You know, just to, to digress for a moment, uh, Eisenhower's uh, message that he prepares in the event of having to withdraw the assault forces, I we think, have is, a copy of it right is, outside uh, our yeah, room. right outside this room, mm -hmm. uh, is really indi indicative of his character. Somebody has drafted it for him, and it says the forces, because the landing was unsuscessful, the forces have been withdrawn, and Pass he scratches voice. that through, and he says, "I have withdrawn the forces." Jesus, so, kind of like Mr. Mistakes were made. That's right. That's right. He he ta he is prepared to own up that it's his decision, his failure, his decision to withdraw the force. Okay, D plus five objectives. We don't reach them till D plus fifty. It's been a terrible uh, campaign following the successful invasion. The Brit the British are stuck before Khan. The Americans are bogged down in the hedgerows. Uh, go and the Germans are defending tenaciously. In a uh, I don't know if anybody has seen pictures. I I mean I'm. I'm I'm a Midwest boy. I think of hedgerows as nice little things, the shrubbery. <laughs> right. uh, Joe Collins, seventh, uh, seventh Corps commander, said the terrain on Guadalcanal, which he previously fought, is far better for mobility than this right. stuff. The hedgerows are 10 or 20 feet high, yes, high and 15 feet uh, thick with the uh, soil. And there's uh, a German machine gun at, a, at the <laughs> behind every place. Everyone. That's yeah. right. So the uh, maybe too much attention, maybe too much attention paid to the invasion, not enough to the terrain and the uh, mobility the requirements of the follow-on operations. But then we get the uh, Operation Cobra using uh, strategic bombers, carpet bombing in close support uh, of ground forces, and that sets up the breakout. Let me sum up uh, what Dr. Perlman and I discussed earlier. First of all, got to review the learning objectives for this lesson uh, in order to stay on track. Second, the themes that uh, Dr. Perlman and I explored were the following. The differing British and American strategic concepts, starting with the British desire to avoid direct fight, a direct fight with the Germans, with the German army, until it could be attrited and worn away through air power and other operations which the Americans called peripheral.
The American desire, on the other hand, was to come to grips with the German army as soon as possible in Northwest Europe. The compromise between these uh, positions, the first compromise, was Operation Torch. Uh, the compromise ultimately favored the British because it led to further operations in the Mediterranean that the Americans didn't want. The mid-war campaigns of the uh, Battle of the Atlantic, 1943, the turning of the tide uh, in the campaign against the U-boat, the North Africa campaign following Af uh, Operation Torch, uh, the American Army, of course, had success in November of 1942 against the Vichy French, but, the, but it met disaster at Kasserine Pass in February of 1943 against the Germans. Explore the idea of what might have happened had the, the United States and British invaded Northwest Europe in 1942 or early 1943, especially uh, with the Americans. Re uh, review the renewed strategic debate that begins about May of 1943 after the German surrender in North Africa. The realization on the Americans' part that it's too late to switch all the resources that have been funneled to the Mediterranean uh, to England for an invasion of Northwest Europe any time during that year. And so the uh, ensuing Sicily and Italy invasions. Also, North Africa and Sicily especially reveal flaws in American uh, doctrine and training in U.S. and British uh, interoperability in the interoperability between air power and ground forces. The Italian campaign, a 20-month grind. Uh, really, it's an economy of force operation for the Germans. Do the, do the Allies get uh, their money's worth for this campaign? The Tehran Conference, where Roosevelt uh, meets Stalin for the first time and really starts to back Stalin at the expense of Churchill. They agree on a cross-channel assault in the spring of 1944, the Allies do, and also that the Soviets will launch their own attack sometime in the spring or summer of 1944. That will turn out to be Operation Bagration. The air campaign, 1943-44. Late 1943, the uh, U.S. Army Air Force is literally uh, being driven from the skies over Germany, and yet by the spring of 1944 has, a to has achieved total air superiority. So that brings us to the spring of 1944. Why do the U.S. and British need to invade Europe in the spring of 1944? Once you answer that question, ask why Normandy. Then there's the view that Normandy is the culmination of all the Army's efforts to that date. Because of this, there is a, a tendency for the Army to look to this battle, the battle for Normandy, the battle to open and hold a lodgment uh, as the end in itself. And so there is an, a resulting failure to look beyond Normandy to see what uh, the campaign what shape the campaign is going to take after that. Then there's the breakout and the pursuit. After very few of the, the post-D-Day objectives have been made as far as expanding the lodgement area, all of a sudden uh, with St. Lo, the, uh, the Americans break out. The German resistance in the west collapses and there's the uh, pursuit for the remainder of the summer. This pursuit, of course, is going to ultimately culminate due to logistic factors. One of the logistics factors is that Montgomery will fail to secure the Scheldt estuary at Antwerp. What effect does this have on the Allies as they move into the fall uh, and of 1944? Of course, there's the debate uh, verse on the, the debate between the idea of the broad front versus the narrow thrust. Montgomery frames the debate in these terms. The, the actual debate is not uh, that simple. Eisenhower, rather than a broad front, actually is proposing two uh, simultaneous axes of advance, but Montgomery frames it as broad front versus narrow thrust. Obviously, he prefers the narrow thrust, and unimaginative Eisenhower uh, favors the broad front. There's Montgomery's failure at Arnhem, or the Allied failure at Arnhem. Uh, and, and the effect that that has on the campaign as uh, summer 
uh, turns into fall in 1944, resulting in, of course, the Germans' Ardennes Offensive, the Battle of the Bulge. After this, there's more strategic debate uh, about how to end the war once the, uh, once the Germans' Ardennes Offensive has been contained. And finally, there are the, the offensives that ultimately reach into the heart of the Third Reich and end, end the war. You can also concern yourself with the legacy of World War II, both in uh, combined arms operations at the tactical and operational level, the formation of the U.S. Air Force based on what the U.S. Army Air Force did uh, during the war, the hostility that will soon uh, develop between the Americans and British on one side and the Soviets on the other, leading to uh, 45 years or so of Cold War, from which we have only in the last decade emerged. So again, uh, we at the Combat Studies Institute, uh, Command and General Staff College, stand ready to assist you anytime we can uh, with any uh, questions you may have. Thank you.